with Ryan Reese. This is live with Ryan Reese. Call now, 1-888-564-6173. Or post your questions using the hashtag LiveRyanReese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. What's up? Saturday night. Wow, my Saturday night has already been insane. I literally took a little nap before I came on the show because I was at the Calvary Chapel uh, Downey Conference today with, uh, shoot, who was there? Jeff Johnson, Cadiz, uh, Mike McIntosh, mm. and several other fellas. And it was really good. Good stuff. But um, I came home, crashed out, woke up, and my daughters were no nap. And they were not happy. Because I had the cousins come down. My dad came down. My mom came down. It was just wild. <laughs> so leaving the house was insanity. Trying to break it up like the Crips and Bloods fighting. It was crazy. <laughs> but I got away, and I'm good now. I took a lot of uh, your guys' advice. Um, a lot of you guys heard the show that I had recently. Or I don't even know if it was recent. It was a couple months back. But I had Holland Davis. He's uh, the pastor of Calvary Chapel San Clemente. Um, he's, you've heard him before on the show. He's, he's a, a worship artist. He's wrote some big songs that churches around the world are still singing today. And um, had him on like a while ago. And we're just talking about the move of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is operating in today's culture and amongst the church. And I know a lot of people are really stoked on, uh, on that, that uh, I was going to say that service, but that show that I had. So I decided to take your advice and bring it back in studio. And uh, what's up? Hey, what's up, man? <laughs> <laughs> I would say how you been, but I keep seeing you all the time. I know. It's, it's like we're regulars. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I like that. Hey, so you've been... Um, You've been teaching over at the uh, Calvary Chapel Bible College mm -hmm. recently. Out in Joshua Springs, yeah, Calvary Bible Institute. and Yeah. Yeah. They, they asked me to come out and teach in the book of Luke. And so we've been going through the book of Luke. But Luke's just an incredible book because it it just is, covers so many different things. And um, the thing that we did most recently is we looked at Luke chapter 4, you know, where Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, mm -hmm. you know, to to uh, liberate the oppressed, to open blind eyes and all that. And so for the last three weeks, we've been talking about what does it take to set people free and with the gospel and breaking strongholds and everything. It's been amazing. How, uh, yeah, so how's that going? Because um, what I've seen, just me travel around, I've seen that with uh, this next younger generation with the uh, Calvary Chapel Movement kids, I, I, don't, I can't speak for other churches because I don't, I don't know, but I have been speaking a lot at Calvary Chapels and... I've talked to uh, you know the millennials and the, and the Gen Z kids, and um, it really seems like I'm seeing that the Holy Spirit's really moving with this uh, next generation. Well, I think there's just a real hunger, you know, for something real, you know, real, something that's really tangible. You know, it's like if you grow up and you have your dad's faith, and it's great that he's got a great faith, but if it's not real to you, then it, you know, then it's not real. And so we're seeing in our culture today, there's, you know, there's a lot of resurgence of, of just like dark things, you know, like Satanism and oh, yeah. things like that, or just like, and even Eastern mysticism's coming back in. You've got raves that they're all spiritually motivated now, you know, the, what's the color fest where it's all basically like Hinduism. Yeah. And there's a real hunger. There's like a desire for something real and tangible. Um, they don't want more like knowledge, yeah. but they want to encounter what they know. Right. And so that's what I'm discovering, especially amongst the millennials. They just really want to know Jesus in a real way and have a real experience. So they're, they're studying, they're reading the Bible, but they want to actually see it play out. They right. Just have like, oh, yeah, well, you, you know, you can cast out demons and you can pray for people. But they actually want they're like, we're reading it. We want to see it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because like when I was first came to Christ you know, I was told just to read the Bible and to pray and God would teach me. And so that's what I did. I wasn't told, you know, not to believe this or not to believe that. And then when I went to a denominational church, um, they just started to tell me like, well, this part of the Bible isn't, doesn't really happen today. You know, God doesn't really do miracles today because we have doctors, you don't need healing. God heals through medicine and a lot. And they, so it just kind of confused me. It wasn't until yeah. I came to California and heard pastor Chuck Smith on the radio. Yeah. 
And he said, hey, everything in the Bible is true. It's all happening at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Come on down. And, and you know, it's like a Book of Acts church. And so that's what we did. We went and we saw God do incredible things. And so as I'm seeing the youth today, or not just even just the youth, the, you know, the 20-somethings and, and even the 30-somethings, it's like they want a faith that is not just book knowledge. They want a faith that's real and that they can experience as true. Do you think the past generation, do you think there was like a gap in between the the guys that grew up, the first generation Calvary Chapel? <clears throat> sorry, my voice is going out. <clears throat> the first generation Calvary guys to where we're at now, do you think there was like a gap of, of where there was just more head knowledge than, than actually trying to live it out and, and see things happen? Well, I think like... The all the first generation Calvary guys that I know, yeah. like the OGs or whatever, yeah, know? yeah, the original, the original gangster pastor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of those guys are still <clears throat> going strong with the Lord. I mean, yeah. they still have like they expect God to do things. Yeah, they don't have any problem with God working and power and miracles and things like that. I mean, yeah. they they saw They've so seen it. much. And but do you think there was something in between with the generation that maybe didn't believe it as well, much? I think what happened is like everything. Whenever you have a the authentic, there's a counterfeit, right? That's what the enemy does. Is like when you have something real, he tries to imitate it and get you off of the real to get you onto the fake. Yeah. And I think that's what happened with the original guys. It's like with the Calvary Chapel things, like like this. There's this real authentic move of God happening, mm -hmm. and um, and then all of a sudden this kind of fake thing arose up, you know, and, and like television, and it began to be kind of exploited, and uh, and then it began to be like, oh hey, come to our, you know, seminars and our conferences, and we'll give you the ten steps to to liberate, you know, the Holy yeah. Spirit in your life, or to, the five, you know, steps to healing the sick, or yeah, and, and they began to categorize this thing that was spontaneous and powerful. I, I remember sitting with um, Odin Fong and asking him, what is the difference between what you see in the Holy Spirit moving today versus the Holy Spirit moving back then? He says, well, the difference I see in what people call the Holy Spirit is that they're trying to organize what can't be organized. They're trying to categorize it and say, you know, this is what how you get it and this is what it is. And he says, you know, a lot of times the Holy Spirit, he'll just he'll just not show up just to show you that he doesn't have to follow your formula. Right. You know, he's just going to break out and do whatever he's going to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think the generation today understands that, like they know it's not something that's contrived. In fact, they're kind of over the contrived. Yeah. They don't want the contrived. I mean, you can have smoke machines and you can create, I mean, I was in music production, so I know how to create, yeah. Like this experience, you know, you've been in that, right? You know, you know how to create, oh, yeah. you know, just push the subs, yeah. feel it in your body. Yes. And all of a sudden you'll start having emotions, right? And you'll have this frenzied feeling. So they don't want that. They want something that's like totally real. Dude, I literally just read an article or watched a video or something somewhere that was literally talking about, <clears throat> you know, in this generation, there's a lot of churches that are, that are creating this, this, this atmosphere that it's an it turns into an emotional like they're 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 encountering like a presence like a like right. an experience. So when you have like the real Holy Spirit encounter presence, you can almost create it with the subs and it, so you don't even know if you're even having a Holy Spirit encounter. Right. It's just more of like an emotional experience. Right. Because you could be in a room with literally no music happening. Right. And the Holy Spirit shows up and you can encounter him and you can tangibly encounter his presence. But yeah, there's there's a lot of this counterfeit where you see a lot of these like thriving churches or they look thriving, but they're creating this like experience. Yeah, this buzz. But there's no there's no like there's no like real Holy Holy Spirit yeah. showing up. Well, it's what a, someone I know used to <clears throat> call a pseudo event. It's a it's a pseudo event. It's a mm -hmm. fake event, you know. And if you're in production, you know how to create that fake event. But what I've noticed recently, at least like in our afterglow services and things like that, and even when I was at um, recently at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs for the Bible College, and I did a afterglow thing there um, in uh, in the Bible College, um, there's just a real gentleness to it. Like I, it's almost like the Holy Spirit saying, "You know what? I don't need all that. I'm just going to go back to 
just me and those people, and it's going to be gentle and a sweet move of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But it's deep and it's and it's real. You know, it's authentic. You know, yep. um, like as I was ministering this past week at your dad's church, it's like the Lord, you know, spoke to me about someone that was mourning a loss in the room, and I didn't know. You know, it's a big room; it's like seventy people. And afterwards, this guy comes up and he. he basically just said, Hey, I, my, I lost my daughter last year and I haven't gotten over it. And he's, he was just broken and he was touched that God would even, you know, identify that it would even know that that's going on in his heart, you know? Yeah. And so we ended up ministering to him and praying for him. And, you know, and then there's another guy there that, that, um, and this is kind of a crazy thing. I've, I've heard this more lately um, than ever before. And that is like kids when they're young, walk in on their parents cheating on each other. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I've known several of those kinds of instances and, you know, and like in this particular one, it created this hatred and this, you know, this just, um, resentment, this resentment that basically controlled this person's life, their whole life. And God set them free. You know, but at first it, they weren't even in touch with what was going on. You know, they they actually came for another problem, you know, and it was in the context of listening to them talk about this one problem that God said, no, that's not the problem. This is the problem. And he began to show me what the problem was. So as I began to ask him questions, because I knew what it was, I just needed him to say it. Mm -hmm. um, when he said it, it was like, because the Lord put the number six in my mind. And so... And so I was waiting for him to say, like, the, you know, something around the number six. And he says, when I was six years old, I walked in and this is what I saw. Mm -hmm. And this has destroyed my life. And he was able to, you know, forgive that person, forgive the whole situation and receive real healing. And then when I asked him afterwards, I says, how how do you feel? And they said, I feel like clean, like cleansed, like like when I got a demon cast out of me, I feel like cleansed. I'm like, oh, nice. Oh, shoot. <laughs> That's awesome. That's the way the Holy Spirit moves. Yeah, it's how individually, because I've I've been um because obviously you know the the listeners um if they don't know uh, my dad has a church out at Calvary Chapel, Diamond Bar out here in uh, L.A. area, and they have a Bible school there, and this is where Holland's um doing did the afterglow, but Holland also does uh, afterglows at his church on the second Tuesday and fourth Tuesday. Second, Second and fourth, and fourth Tuesday. Tuesday every month at Calvary Chapel San Clemente. And uh, I've been there for those as well. And yeah. it's the same thing. It's I mean, there's like acoustic playing. You, you'll you play some music. There might be some key. I can't remember. Some keys, maybe a little cajon or something. Mm -hmm. Something real simple. And then um, just kind of chill, share some scripture. And then um, just let the Holy Spirit show up and just start uh, touching people's lives individually. Yeah. What's awesome is when I was here at Costa Mesa, mm -hmm. Calvary Chapel, um, my bass player was this guy by the name of Roger Charles. And, and, and so like, he's this ridiculous architect, but I only know him as a bass player. And we're, we, you know, and, and as we've grown over the years, we realized we had a lot of the same ministry experiences. And so, um, he, you know, he decided, Hey, I feel like I got to come down and help you. And so he's been kind of helping with the afterglows and actually running the afterglows and um and so it's been it's just been interesting cuz we both remember the time in Calvary Chapel when the Holy Spirit was moving powerfully and it wasn't like this charismatic kind of weird thing yeah it was just like if you were sick you just got prayed for and God healed you yeah. and you would come to church and and people would just say hey I just feel like God wants to share something with you and they would just tell you something that would just rock your world, you know, because it was, it was authentically God. And it wasn't like in the midst of this weird meeting or someone yelling at you or, you know, trying to do some crazy, you know, yeah. I had one guy try to hit me in the head and knock me down and all this crazy stuff, you know, and, and it's just, it was never anything like that. It was just this gentle move of the Holy spirit. Yeah. Yes. That's, you know, what's interesting too is, um, uh, my dad um, just opened up our our church on <clears throat> our church on Wednesday nights. He's uh, they, you know, he'll teach, and then they were kind of just doing these afterglows. So it's been pretty cool to to see. It's like a it's just a new work, you know, in our, yeah. in our church and praying for people and just seeing what God's doing. It's it's awesome. 
So as you've been um, working with a lot of these youngsters out at uh, the Bible College, what's what's been going on up there with these with these guys? Like you've been teaching a class on strongholds and. Well, it started. It's it's in Luke. We just been going through Luke, but Luke oh, okay. is all through Luke. They're talking about healing. They're talking about casting demons out and yeah. stuff like that. So we just been bringing the reality of that, you know, and uh, home to the students. And you know, one of the things we talked about in this last this last couple of weeks was specifically dealing with you know when Jesus says, you know, I've come to to um, bring freedom to the prisoners of war. I've come to heal the brokenhearted. I've come to free the oppressed. And, you know, we've just talked about that whole idea of what does it mean when you're brokenhearted? You know, what, is that, what does that actually have to do with, you know? And, and actually what's interesting, because in the Greek, it means like basically an event that breaks. It's literally a, an event that crushes you. It can crush you physically, emotionally, spiritually, it, 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 your heart, your mind, um, you, you know, and and talking about people that have been raped, people that have gone through a traumatic event, something like they, a loss of a parent, yeah. an accident or something, mm -hmm. where not only do they come out of it, you know, just emotionally hurt, but sometimes it can damage them psychologically and all kinds of things. And it's interesting that that's in the book of Luke right here. It's the heal the broken heart. And Jesus says, I came to heal that. I came to, to restore, you know, that and, to, and to deal with that in your life. And it's interesting how, um, I remember in one of our afterglow services, someone that was having like real panic attacks and anxiety and stuff like that. And I just, um, I just felt like, oh, we need to, you know, God's, there's a reason for this. It's not just, you know, a physical thing. Right. And so we prayed and the, I just said, I, th I feel like there's a doctor that gave you a diagnosis, misdiagnosed you. And then, and um, so they began to list a whole litany of doctors they've been to and all the different diagnoses. And so I prayed and the Lord showed me a picture of a woman and with a, a specific hairdo. And I said, you know, it was kind of a weird brown hair. And I said, this is what I see. Does that mean anything? And, he, and the person goes, um, yeah, that that's one of the doctors. And I said, what did this person say? And so he said it, and I said, that's what you believed. So we're going to now renounce that. Now, what had happened when I started to pray for him before I started to ask him these questions was his body temperature went up like 10 degrees. Like you physically could feel him getting hot to the touch. And then we, um, and then after the Lord showed us that, and then we said, okay, we want you to, I want you to renounce whatever they um, whatever diagnosed lie. you. Yeah. So whatever they said was true for you, I want you just to reject it. And he rejected it, and we prayed over him. And then we literally, as we're praying for him, we could feel his skin temperature drop to where it was cold to the touch. It was just the weirdest thing. And that was it. The anxiety has been gone. And so, you know, so it came down to this event that he believed mm -hmm. that broke his heart. And so God came to heal his broken heart. And by re by healing his broken heart, it kind of revealed to him that, hey, I don't have to believe that anymore. I can believe something different. You know, just that person believing that one thing. Do you know how many more people in the world have had these lies spoken over them? That they're buying into. Yeah. Like everyone's bipolar now. Yeah. Everyone has mental illness. Everyone, you know, it's, you know, I know there's so much, bi everyone's bipolar. That That's the one common thing when I, when I talk to people, you know, there, there was a girl, uh, Amor Sierra, I had her on the show a while ago, but she grew up in Miami and she actually used to get, um, she used to get, uh, I mean, many things like raped and molested and the whole, you know, just horrible, horrible stuff to her. So she used to dress like a man. And not take showers and just be dirty because she did not want a man to look at her because the only relationship she knew with between a man was they wanted to have they wanted to have sexual and use right. her, you know. So one day one of her friends said to her when Derek she was like in, you know, high school, Hey, check out so and so, you know, she's a lesbian, you know, you might like her. And in her mind she's like, Wait a minute. She's like, I'm not a lesbian. I don't like girls, but then all of a sudden like that lie started manifesting over her and she thought, Oh, well, maybe I am, maybe I'm a lesbian. Maybe, th maybe this is why I am the way I am. And then that led her 
into a whole life of, you know, being a homosexual. And then, you know, she ended up getting saved. And like her story is crazy. But basically, that's what happens is people speak these lies over people. And then they just, that's just like a stronghold in their life. Yeah. Well, that that's the other thing. It's like, you know, it says that Jesus came to set the oppressed free, you know. And not only are these, these tragic events that happen that mm-hmm. shape us, but there's also situations where, especially people that struggle with same-sex attraction, mm-hmm. it's like they have a lifetime of lies being spoken over them and a lifetime of oppression and a lifetime of just being you know, ignored or being neglected or, you know, or being abused. And where it's not just a one-time event, it's it happens so many times throughout their life that they begin to believe yeah. that this is what I am. This is, you know, how I'm identified. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, and the thing is, is that even in those circumstances, uh, sometimes it's, it can take longer. It just depends on if, how willing the person is to let the past go and actually believe who they are in Christ, yep. that they're a new creation. You know, the old is past, the new has come. But a lot of times it really, you know, in a moment, Jesus can take a lifetime of oppression of, and to where you, you begin to believe. Like, for instance, in my own life, um, I've always wanted to be a musician, but I was told that I could never make it as a musician. You know, that I was, uh, so I went to become an accountant. And so like, you know, <laughs> those two are in the same world, right? You know, yeah. musician and accountant is like, those two yeah. make so much sense to go together. <laughs> but like, I just thought, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Well, I fell asleep in the accounting classes because I was so bored. I flunked out of accounting. Yeah. Now I wish I would have paid more attention, but now, <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I could use it. But the reality of it is, is that that told me something about myself that it wasn't okay for me to be who I really am. And, you know, and it came from all different angles. It came from all different sides that there was something wrong with me to where I just thought God could never use me, you know? And so when God gave me a song that went around the world and basically has paid my, my bills my whole life. What what song is that? A song called let it rise. Let it rise. Yeah, it's Everyone still rising. It. It's still, it is still rising. <laughs> it's, and and basically, that's God has used that song to fund our church. God has used that song to fund my you know my whole life. Basically, it's amazing. He's just taken care of it. And so, in essence, you know, by doing that, God disproved all the things that I believed about myself. Mm-hmm. You know, and in a moment, He changed it all. And He can do that for anybody. One hundred percent. That's so interesting because I was just speaking at a continuation school um, on Thursday. I posted a picture recently, but it was it was an after school event. It was at a continuation school, and obviously, I went to continuation school. You go there when you get kicked out of school. I I got kicked out of the continuation school. You know, <laughs> never made you know, yeah, that didn't work out too well for me. But <laughs> these these students that are there, they're there because they they're just not good at school, or for whatever reason, they just can't make the grade, so they get stuck here. In the school, and you 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 already know the vibe of that school, how many lies and stuff has been spoken over these kids. So it's so interesting when I got to pray with them at the end, I got to lead them to the Lord. Just everyone that was there at the end of the school came to give their life to Jesus. But then after I got to pray over them, and I just prayed like God, you know, we don't have to live under those underneath those lies yeah. that have been spoken to us. Those things are like curses. You know, we are a new creation. We're we are sons of God. We are, mm. we are, uh, daughters of, of God. You know what I mean? And we don't have to live under that anymore. And you could just see when I was just praying for them, they were just like, cause it was just like, you know, they're just, they're just full of lies. Right. This generation. Yeah. Well, see, and that's why it's so important to teach the word of God from mm. verse by verse, from Genesis to revelation, because then you start hearing what God actually says yeah. about you. you, what he actually believes about you and not just what he says to us individually, but how he, who he is throughout all of history. He never changes. Yeah. He's never changed his MO. He's always been a God of mercy and grace and compassion. You see it with the nation of Israel. And, you know, so often people, you know, look at the Old Testament, they see this God of wrath that just hates people and wants to like, you know, blow up cities and stuff like that. But that's not it at all. You know, as I look through the scripture, this, you know, we've taught from Genesis Revelation, our church, we've done it all the way through one time and we're yeah. on our second time through now. But but as I was looking through, I looked specifically through the lens of grace. And what I saw was a God that would do things 
to show mercy and compassion and and was merciful when when he you know when the law said he should have judged showed compassion was long suffering and finally when Israel got to the point where they just pushed it way past over the line mm-hmm. then God finally had to say okay I can't I got to I got to do something now you've pushed your, you've pushed it way over the line you're going to go into captivity and I think it is that way for many people you know they push they push they push and after a while God says you know if you want to go into captivity then you can go into captivity it's not what I want for you and there's a lot of people that choose captivity because they believe these lies that have been spoken of they believe the things that have been done to them you know things that you know they think well if this happened to me I must not be worth anything to anybody it must be true yeah they have that uh, that sh- they carry that shame mm-hmm. unforgiveness and the lies no I, I I do see that you know we were uh we were at this other event I'm not gonna say exactly where just to keep the students confidential but I, we were there at this event and we were praying for the students and there was there was just this heaviness in the room that people were just holding on to this the shame of their past these young kids and that's that's what the enemy's really doing these days is he's, he's keeping people under the shame and, and that they're stuck with, with everything of their past mm-hmm. and they're not being set free. They're not believing it's cause they're not, they're not believing who God says, what he says about them. Right. You know, they're just, and that's what's holding. I feel like that's these strongholds on people's lives. Yeah. And the, and the thing is, is that how can people, how can people get set free of that stuff? Well, first of all, they have to recognize what it is. You know, there's so much bad teaching about strongholds Mm -hmm. because most people say, well, a stronghold is demonic. So it's, Mm -hmm. you got to cast a demon out of someone or, you you know, that is all demonically empowered and strongholds are not demonic. They're natural. We make strongholds. So when you have like a, a child that's getting beaten or you have a, you know, we had a lady in our home group that was, um, called it now they call it dissociative identity disorder but it, back then it was multiple personality disorder mm-hmm. so it was awesome because you know we could have a whole group of people or we could just have us and her and it was just us and her it was still like 25 people was in the room so it was it was kind of it was a lot of it was very interesting you know um but you know she had been ritualistically abused by in an occult group you know in her hometown and so somewhere in her mind, just to survive, she created a little room that she would go to, and that was her safe space in her mind. And these other personalities that were really her her own creation to defend herself, to, to just to survive through this immense torture. Wow. Um, those things emerged. And so, it, you know, so as you're praying for someone like that, you know, and you know, she's believing Jesus. She's a Christian born again, filled with the Holy spirit, but now she's struggling with this, you know, survival mechanism basically that she now wants to get rid of, you know, how do you get rid of that? You know? And so part of it is recognizing that you're not dealing with demons because if you try to cast out a part of a person, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, if she's filled with the Holy spirit, there's no demons in her. So So yeah, she's yeah. So it's something else. So over time, we had to help her understand that she didn't need all those protective mechanisms anymore, that Jesus was her stronghold. You know, she had a greater stronghold in Jesus and that she can she can let those walls down. And a lot of it happens through forgiveness. You know, you have to forgive the people that did things to you um, as hard as that is. And people think like, well, am I letting them off the hook? Is that what forgiveness is? It's like, no. Forgiveness is simply giving to God the right and the authority to judge. I'm going to give it back to God. He's the righteous judge. I'm not. And when I was offended, I became the judge and I decided what was going to be the punishment. But I need to return that back to God. Let him be sovereign. Hold that thought because we're going to go to break in about five minutes. You are listening to Live with Ryan Reese. I have Holland Davis in studio from Calvary Chapel, San Clemente. Come out and check us out down in San Clemente on the second Tuesday and the fourth Tuesday every single month at 7 p.m. We'll see you guys right after the break. Ryan Race coming up. Everything all right? Call now. 
1-888-564-6173. Or post your questions using the hashtag LiveRyanReese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Uh, I think I speak for the entire administration when I say... Now, back to live with Ryan Reese. Don't say we didn't warn you. Loud noises! We are... <laughs> I don't know. Let me see if that was your wife. Nope, wasn't. <laughs> hey, uh, we are back. We are back. We were just talking about the strongholds right before the break with Holland Davis from Calvary Chapel, San Clemente. You know, I want to plug your church really quick. Um, when are your services... Just in case people live in South County. Yeah, we're Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. We're meeting at Vista Del Mar School. And, um, you know, and then we do Thursday night Bible studies at our new building that we're get about. We're like literally weeks away from moving into. Nice. And, um, and that's 7 p.m. on Thursdays. So, but they can check us out at calvarysanclemente.org and go to the website and see what all is happening. Yeah. And uh, we're just, you know, God's just building a church. It's, we've seen it start from eight people and go up to what it is now. And it's, it's just awesome. exciting. <laughs> well, when I go, I always like the vibe there. So it's awesome. Um, okay. So right before the break, we were talking about the strongholds, Holland. And you were just saying, you were talking about how um, people get these strongholds in their life. And uh, some of the stuff is from like, un- we create them, you said. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, like, you know, the, the natural fight or flight mechanisms, God created it. It's to help us escape danger, right? So, so if you are in a dangerous situation, either you're going to stand your ground and fight or you're going to run for your life. Um, but when you're like, you know, two, three, four, or even six, seven, eight, and you're in what you believe to be a dangerous situation, mm-hmm. you're being assaulted, you're being abused, you're being, raped you're being attacked or whatever um a little child doesn't have the mental capacity to know how to deal with that sort of thing and so what they end up doing is their flight mechanism is to go internal and so they'll build up a psychological uh, a psychological barrier in their mind that basically becomes like a protective zone and usually that psychological barrier is kind of held together by some kind of a lie or some kind of a, a, a judgment uh, about the situation or a vow that they're going to make. For instance, um, when we would, we were involved in a ministry that helped people that came out of the um, homosexual lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we would discover over and over again is that at some point in time, 
someone because of of how they were treated, because they felt neglected, because they didn't feel understood or they felt different or whatever, oftentimes they would make a vow that just was like, you know what, I am never going to be like my dad or I'm never going to be like my mom. Or a lot of times the girls would say, I'm never going to let a man touch me the way that you know, my dad touched my mom or I it hurt my mom. Right. I'm not, I'm never going to do that. And this, this internal judgment that they make this, 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 com- it's almost like a commitment to Impact. themselves. Yeah. Commi- yeah. You know? And so this thing becomes a barrier between them and any other relationship in the world. And that begins to form the way they look at relationships, the way they look at man, you know, people that are like, you know, men are evil or, uh, they they only want one thing, you know. Like I tell my church, it says men really want two things: we want food, and we want sports. That's really it. <laughs> but you know, and that the, food is tacos. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so it's like you know, there's there there's these, and and you've heard it in the culture, like you know, women only want one thing, you know, and we make jokes about those things, but oftentimes those those become the things that become these strongholds in people's lives. And what happens is because they're built on unbelief, because they're built on a lie, because they're built on on bitterness or unforgiveness, because a, a lot of times a little child doesn't know how to forgive. They don't know how to deal with those things. Um, it attracts evil. And so it's kind of like having a hangnail or like having a, a splinter. And every time you hit that splinter, it's like it, it just you know, causes you to flinch, you know, right. it just hurts you. And and the enemy, you know, can't, if you're a believer, it can't possess you, but it can sure take that hurt spot and torture you. You're, with you're it. Irritate it. Yeah, yeah. irritate it, you know, and just remind you of, of, of the lies that are going, you know, and, 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 sh- and just mm-hmm. heap the, the more lies and more shame on them to the point where you just can't tell the difference. You can't tell the voice of evil versus the voice of the world versus versus your own voice. You, you can't tell it becomes a, a blur. And through prayer, I've seen the Holy Spirit just come in and just separate all of that out and get to the real heart of what's going on in someone's life mm-hmm. and set that person free. Uh, I and, it's, and it happens in the most bizarre ways. I mean, I, I remember being at a um, Exodus International Conference and I just – saw a girl um and she just looked like she just felt out of place there and um and i just walked up and i says i just said i want you to know that the that i and i was leading worship i was on the platform says i want you to know that the lord brought me from the front of the room to the back of the room so that i could tell you how much he loves you and as soon as i and i just gave her a hug and as soon as i did that she completely broke Hmm. It, it wasn't like I had to lead her through some radical confession or prayer. Yeah, yeah. It was just a simple demonstration of the love of God. And what happened is in her mind, what she told me afterwards is she says, I, she's felt so out of place. Like she couldn't relate to, you know, she didn't want to know how to get out of her struggle. But when I did that, all of a sudden she just felt God's love in a way that it was okay. It's like, it's okay. You know, I, I don't feel... Like I belong, but I belong. I don't feel like I'm, I can open up, but I can open up because God loves me. And I watched her throughout the days that we were, you know, with, together around each other. I watched her open up to the Lord and God do a wonderful work in her life. You know, you hear him audibly or how does, how does God speak to one? How, how can one learn to hear God's voice more for the listeners? Well, that's, I mean, that's an interesting question because, you know, when I came to Christ, I had, I heard an audible voice of God. That's what brought me to Christ. So I just thought everybody heard an audible voice. You know, they walk around, God's talking in their head all the time. Yeah. Then I realized that no, the the ones that do that, they need medication. Yeah. So, (laughs) but, but no, I just, so there's a part of it where it's however God uses you. But I know with me, as I'm kind of praying, sometimes I'll get like a literally a movie running yeah. through my head. Like we had a girl coming to our, we did a one step for uh, to freedom ministry, like a rehab ministry. And this girl came in with her dad and she said she was struggling with heroin and g- gave a little bit of her story. And as she's telling her story, I see this movie in my head 
of this girl taking this this doll, ceramic doll, breaking its face in and throwing it in the dirt, and the doll was all dirty, and the, the dress was all dirty on the doll. And so when she got done, I says, that's a great story. I says, I have to tell you, though, when, when you were telling the story, this is the picture I got in my head, and I described this movie that I was seeing yeah. in my head. And she looked at her dad, and she looked at me, and I says, so did you have porcelain dolls? As a kid, she goes, yes, and I used to smash their faces in. And I'm like, oh, I said, so what was going on during that time? Because I said, right. that's, that's going to the pro That's going right to the problem. Yeah, right. I said, that's where your addiction started. Wow. And so all of a sudden, is like she looks at the dad, and the dad looks at her, and dad basically says, well, that's when my kids were mo being molested by their babysitter. Oh, my god! And that was literally what started the addiction in her life. But... How would I have known that? I, there's no way I could have known that. Yeah, no. You no, know, it was the Holy yeah. Spirit. You know, there was another girl, lady that came into our office. My wife and I were there, and as I'm hearing her story, you know, I'm seeing like the, again this movie. I see this wooden floor. I see this white window, and and it's sunny. And then I see these black shoes that are like patent leather shoes, and and um and white stockings, and this dress, and dark hair. And I hear this voice, like just yelling and screaming, and 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 uh, and so I describe this whole situation. I says, "Did you have a a dress like this? Did you have stockings? Did you yeah. live in a house with a wooden floor?" She said, "Yes." And um, and I said, um, "And I said, you, and you used to have these black shoes that were like platinum black, shiny with a with a strap over, it, and there was a name like of them. I didn't, I don't know what the name yeah. is." But there was like a specific name. She goes, yeah. So I says, I don't know why the Lord brought me that picture, but that that's a significant moment in your life. Well, they came to church on Sunday and brought a, a picture, and it was exactly what I saw. It was her yeah. in a dress, black hair, white stockings, this, the little patent leather shoes, and it was their family calendar, and she was crying in the family calendar. Wow. And And – and basically, God was just uncovering a moment in her life that He wanted to minister to, you know, and and uh, and 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 through that, bring some healing and forgiveness, you know, so that she could receive healing right. in that area. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah, because that that's how the Holy Spirit is. He so he just targets. Yeah, you know. And sometimes though, I'll get one word. I'll just like a word pops in my head and I'll just say, you know, I used to have this friend back in uh, Atlanta. He, he plays guitar for uh, Matt Redman and different guys uh, used to. And um, I would just call him up and say, this is the word for the year. And I, I would just say, God would just give me one word. I said, this is the word. And uh, he would call me back and says, I don't know what that word means. And then he would call me up three months later and be I like, know I know exactly means. what that word means, you know. <laughs> So God speaks in a variety of ways, you know, mm -hmm. but a lot of times I start with the scriptures. God gives me a scripture. God, you know, as I'm expositing or teaching through a scripture, it's like all of a sudden something will pop in my mind mm -hmm. that has to do with that scripture and what God wants to do in that moment with that group of people. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what happened the other night at the um, at, at Golden Springs in the Bible colleges. I just taught through Acts chapter two, and as I'm teaching through and just saying, hey, you know, God wants to move in power. He's a God, you know, he poured out his Holy Spirit and gave us power to be witnesses. He wants everyone in this room to have power to be witnesses. Mm -hmm. And so we're just going to start there. And as we began to pray, God just began to bring other things up. I've, I've witnessed that kind of stuff where you're just teaching and you do, it's not like you're trying to do anything. You're just teaching. And then all of a sudden you just end up in that, in that moment where the Holy Spirit's just leading you and just keep stepping out by faith and next you know. He just starts showing up um, yeah. in a big way. Yeah, I had a guy that was in our church that literally, um, no, actually he visited. He was just visiting. And in the middle of my message, I'm talking about something, and I just said, I don't know why I, I'm thinking this, but I think there's someone here, and you're praying about starting a new business, and the Lord just wants you to know to go for it. He's, he's in it. He's going to provide. So it turned out to be this Calvary Chapel pastor was visiting from the East Coast. <laughs> and he, like, you know, came up afterwards and, so, and said, uh, 
where did that come from? I says, I it had to be the Holy Spirit. I don't know. And he goes, because he, he's been praying about buying a business. And he was, you know, kind of conflicted. Then he heard that word. And then he went back and he did it. And then he came back and visited our church like a couple years later and says, the business is going great. The church is going great. God's blessing. And it's been a tremendous thing. So you just, it, it's just when you're, here's the thing. We are people of the presence of God, right? Yeah. The presence of God is with us, is in us. Yep. And um, and so wherever we are, the Holy Spirit is there, and He He wants to do a work more than we're even aware that He wants to do a work. In fact, He's always working. Right. He's working around us all the time. And so, as people of God, if we're truly representing Him, if we're truly allowing Him to work in and through us, then things naturally happen around us. So, people that are listening right now, maybe they're saying. Well, this stuff doesn't happen around me. Like I'm, where I'm going to church, I'm reading, but I'm not seeing these things happen. Do you what? What would you say to them? Do you think they're just? Do you think they're in, they're caught up in too much noise? Do you think they're not um, oh, like listening to see what God wants? Well, aware because you, I know I can miss opportunities just being busy about your day. Right. Like you could, I'm reading. There's days where I'm like, I gotta get this. I'm on my list, and there's opportunities I know that happen that I miss. Because I'm just busy, and it's so easy to get stuck in a in a in the rat race of normal day life. You have to literally be open as you leave your house, as you're in the grocery store. God wants to work, like you were saying. Yeah, He always wants to work in different situations. But from my experience, there's days when I'm just not in it, and I'm I know I'm missing opportunities. What well, what would you say about that? Well, I do the same thing. I mean, because it's we we're it's human beings. It's normal. But here's the thing. Jesus began every day with the Father, and I don't think he did it because it's like I'm a I'm a good little Jesus follower, yeah. following myself or whatever, yeah. you know. And I'm I got to be the model for everyone, and so I'm going to model this life of prayer. So, I think he spent time with the Father because that was all that mattered to him. He just knew that it was about him and the Father. And whatever happened out of that time with the father, you know, that's that's what the point is, right? Somehow in our busy lives, we, you know, even ministry becomes something like, oh, I got to do the ministry. Or I got to prepare to do the ministry. Yeah. Whereas the reality of it is, is that, no, we're, the ministry is what the father wants to do through us. Yeah. It's what Jesus wants to do through us. It's what the Holy Spirit is leading to us to do all the time. And oftentimes, and, and and it is a journey. There is a journey to this because you have to begin by intentionally deciding, I'm going to just take a risk and follow Jesus. I'm going to be a Jesus follower. Now, when I, when the Holy, when Lonnie Frisbee prayed for me, the Holy Spirit came upon me in a real powerful way. There was a period of several months after that where I, I mean, it was like, I was so in tune with, with God and with the Holy Spirit. And it's like, I would literally one day I was going to to work and God said, turn left. I turn left, go turn right, turn right, go into this apartment complex. So I went in the apartment complex and it's like, go to this door. And I went up to this door and says, knock on the door. And I knocked on the door and it was, and it was a person from our church. And God sent me and said, the Lord just sent me to you. I don't know why do you need prayer? And it turned out that they needed prayer. And the Lord just like, you know, just said, you know, basically sent me on this thing. But, but, my life got busy and and that began to fade yeah. and let more and more out of my life. Well, what's happened recently is that the Lord has been convicting me of that. Yeah. Like, you know, like you were here. Now you're now you're in a different place. Well, that's my question. How do you get back there for the listeners? Well, Revelation tells us, first of all, remember, you got to remember what it was like. That's why I think it's important to talk about revival. I think it's important for us to get an idea of what God did in the Jesus movement days for the guys that lived it to, to tell us what it was like so that we can remember. And then it, and then it says you have to change your thinking. That's what repent means. Yeah. You, to change your thinking. Yep. You have to stop thinking the way you do about life. You have to stop thinking about the way the way you do about your job. You have to stop thinking the way you do about your relationships and families, and you need to start seeing them the way that Jesus sees them. You know that every moment in your day, every person that you meet, 
is a divine appointment. God wants to do something there. Uh, yeah, seriously, huh? Yeah. Every, every person. Every person is a divine appointment. You're sent by God. So you're not employed at a job. You're sent by God to go into that workplace to be a representative of Jesus Christ. You know, and so in my mind, I think I go to job, I go to work to do a job and, and to work. But in reality, no, I'm going as a representative of Jesus Christ. Now, yeah. we need to expand even our idea of what that means, because do you think Jesus knows how to sell stuff? Absolutely. You think Jesus knows the, the how to manage people? Absolutely. Do you think Jesus knows how to, that he wants to empower us to do even the mundane things? Because everything in our life, if we belong to Jesus, everything belongs to Jesus. Yeah. It's, none of it's mundane. None of it's ordinary. It's all extra to ordinary. Right. And so when I begin to see that, every you know, any kind of you know, place that I go, I'm really being led by the Spirit of God. And that's one thing that Pastor Chuck lived. Um, I had a friend that you know, said one day, you know, Chuck called him and says, let's go. I need to go to Santa Barbara. Would you come with me? And they're pulling out of the parking lot, and they said, hey, I just feel like, Chuck goes, I just feel like driving up the coast. And do you mind? He's like, no. And they drove up the coast. And as they're going up the coast, all every place they stopped, God had divine appointments. No way. And the same thing was they come back, these divine appointments, all the way till they get back to the church. And Chuck turns to my friend and goes, you know, I didn't wake up this morning and say, the Lord told me to drive up the coast. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. just, I, but I was just aware that everywhere I am, God is working. Right. There was an awareness. He changed the way he thought about everything that he was doing. And that's something we have to change. We have to change the way we think about what we're doing. And then it says to go back and do those things all over again. So go back. Now, if you've never, if you don't have a place to go back to, yep. then it's going back to those stories that you heard about revival and trusting God. You know, the early days of Calvary Chapel, when it was about seeking the Lord, it was about being in his word, not not because we're like trying to be Bible fanatics. It's just because we want to know Jesus. Yep, exactly. And it's re it's coming back to that beginning point again. What I've seen, we have, I think we have like five minutes left. What I've seen is, um, and even in my personal life, sometimes it happens, but people go on like a mission trip and they're all lit when they come back because God was just showing up, you know, they were aware because they were like, we're going on a mission. So their whole mind was like, we're doing this, you know, right. but then when you come back, you just get in the, the grind and you just kind of lose that, that fire until next mission. Like, you feel like I have to wait till the next mission trip. But the reality is it's happening all around you. Cause I mean, I, I tour, yeah. I tour for like a week and two and it's like, it's like, God's miracles, one after another, just things just happening. Everything it seems like every single thing's an a divine appointment. But then when I get back, sometimes I'm like, oh, I got my family. I'm just gonna go to the local, you know, Starbucks or whatever. But it's like it's always to keep that the mind of Christ on, yeah, and what He's doing. And I think that's the hardest. That's that's the hardest thing to balance as us as people is to just think that no, every single day we need to have the mind of Christ. And every opportunity is a divine appointment at some capacity. I mean, think about this. Even like when it comes to your wife or your kids, if you were listening to the Holy Spirit for them and you just. And, I just yell. Yeah. No, <laughs> stop it, girls. You're destroying the house. No. <laughs> I, just, I know. But you Holy know, Spirit, man, wait, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> what are you saying right now? You're saying spank them. Okay. Okay. No, <laughs> no. no it's like, it's like, what if. What if we just listen to God for those things? And, you know, this is something that is kind of a new thing for me, because when my kids were growing up, I was like every typical parent. I wasn't always hearing God for my kids. I was just trying to I was so focused on wanting to be better than what I was raised and being a good father and all this stuff. I didn't you know, and I was reading books at the time I was going to school for counseling. And so it was like I wanted to have this, you know, different experience for my kids. And um but now I'm learning to just go, okay, God, you created us. You know what, what we need. Yeah. You know, you know what my kids need. I don't know what my kids need, but you do. How can you empower me that? How can you lead me? And you know what? I think by doing that, we can actually help our kids not develop strongholds. Mm -hmm. We can actually help them process through life and understand life and know that they're loved as they're going through things. So they don't have to, Jesus can be their stronghold, you yeah. know? Yeah.
one hundred percent. Um, we have like three minutes left. Um, well, as we're here, think just here on the radio. Um, do you want to uh, maybe pray for the listeners that are, maybe are going through these things in their life? That um, maybe if they're dealing with a stronghold, that God will set them free, because God's everywhere. We know that. And then also those ones that um, just want to get more in tune with God, and they're they they need that they need that power of the Holy Spirit upon their lives. Just just lift up lift them up in prayer. Yeah. But one just quick thing. Yeah. You know, as far as like, you know, if you're in a place that really doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit, it's going to be hard to be in tune with the Spirit in a place like yeah. that. Um, and you do need to find a place that where they are open to God speaking, that they're open to God doing things today. And, and that's what I love about Calvary Chapel is there seems to be a move where a resurgent right now throughout the Calvary Ch Chapel movement of people being open to the Holy Spirit and open to what he wants to do in their lives. And it's, and so it'd be a good place to, to begin. But, um, I just want to, um, pray. For anyone that's listening right now and that is dealing with a stronghold, that's dealing with something, uh, and first of all, to know that um, that by your spirit, Lord, that they would know that they're forgiven, that, Lord, that there is nothing that you hold against them, that you paid the price, not only for the sins that they've done, but the sins that have been done against them. And that not only can they be forgiven, but, Lord, you've given them the power to forgive. And Lord, that you have um, empowered them with your Holy Spirit, that if they receive your spirit right now, that you will fill them afresh. And maybe where you're at, you can just stop and just say, I receive that empowering of the Holy Spirit right now upon my life. By faith, I just open my heart up and I receive it. And there are those that you need to forgive. You need to give back to God the right and the authority to judge the person that has offended you, that has hurt you, that you need to give that back to God and allow him to do what he's going to do in that person's life, that you can release them from your judgment and give it over to Jesus, the righteous judge, because he will deal with it a lot better than any of us can. And so in your heart, just to say back to the Lord, Lord, I surrender this person back to you. I forgive them for what they've done to me, and I give you the right and authority to judge in the situation. You judge between me and them, and you do whatever you're going to do, and I will submit to your decision, whatever you desire, and I release it back to you. And in fact, just even by doing that, there's a, a, a release of freedom that comes into our life, just the freedom of forgiving someone else. That tortured mind, that tortured heart, begins to be liberated, begins to go away, because as we forgive, God just releases us. This has been Live with Ryan Reese. To connect or find out more about Ryan, click on ryan-reese.com. Check us out next Saturday at 9 p.m. for Live with Ryan Reese.